to do a video. Just a minute. So yeah. Pat, set the us up. Lines. Yeah. All right. So uh, we are here in Venice, uh, looking to uh, put some. Uh, trying to figure out what we're going to do uh, about the, the street folks in Venice that are uh, part of the community and are, uh, are, are being dealt with as if uh, they shouldn't or don't belong when, you know, we know this is Venice. This is kind of part of the, the, the vibe here. How can we bring it all into balance in a way that that is not uh, making it hard for neighbors who have other reasons to uh, to come to Venice and appreciate it? Yeah, Pat. So I mean, I'm Aaron. I'm sort of Pat say, uh, you know, like from from the folks who are living on the street, the perspective of how can we be good neighbors? And this is an interesting perspective because you know, obviously, there's so many people who are. Um, on the streets who don't want to be on the streets. And we, we got to create a pathway to get people off the streets. Um, but we also have to focus on, a, you know, is, is saying uh, what, what people can do to, to be good neighbors while on the streets. Um, and I think the big picture outside of this larger project of getting people off the streets is, is how can we decrease the dehumanizing of people, right? And how can we connect with people as individuals in like a neighborly way? Um, and I think this is just a huge part of the conversation is just like in the larger political dynamic of local politics is like, how do we talk to each other's neighbors? You right. Know? Uh, we'll do the pass around. A lot of our footage is like this from Renaissance and it's really cool because you, you see the camera like moving hands. Do, by the way, do we want to be this way or the other no, way? No, 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 this way. Okay, okay. <laughs> you can always edit this to that. Yeah, sure, like, sure, sure. Uh, uh, so yeah, my name is Sultan Shreve. Um, to, to that note you were just saying, so I got involved, I um, used to live on Dudley off and on for 10 years, right, off the way up to the boardwalk, and then during COVID, you know, it's just gnarly out here, so I ended up getting involved, and so I met Pat, and, uh, but I ended up sleeping on the boardwalk for about a month after Labor Day, like, there were a bunch of attacks happening and stuff like that, and we had, like, a community garden on the corner rows, people probably saw it with all the flowers and working and stuff, there's still a Breonna Taylor mural, that's the one vestige left of Venice, of that one section of Venice. But anyway, so I, so I remember the first day that I, and I'm a PhD student at USC, and so this is part of my research, but also just being an activist, um, which I've been for 10 years. And so, uh, so yeah, so I, I sleep on the boardwalk, I wake up, you know, and like there's a customary like black man nod to the folks too, you know, you see a, a, another black man. And so I give him the nod and his kids were getting out of the parking lot, which is behind where my tent was. And then he like took his kids and like turned their head away, like don't look at that person, you know? And it was like, the. and then at first I was really confused. And then it took me a second to realize like he had seen me crawl out of a tent, you know? And so even though I like have this I, this sense of myself or my identity or how I'm used to being perceived, it was all gone. Like master's degree didn't matter. PhD didn't matter, all of my life accomplishments, nothing mattered. Like I was just a person getting out of a tent and I shouldn't be looked at, you know? And I feel like that, like almost sort of that base level is getting lost in a lot of the conversation. Like it means something to be a neighbor. Like I'm from Detroit originally. Like I knew all my neighbors. Our neighbors, we babysat, they, they gave sugar. Like when your ball went in the backyard, you had to like knock on the door sometimes or like hop the fence to go get it. Like neighbors, being a neighbor used to mean something. And I feel like because we have a transient community and a lot of, you know, like young folks moving in, but then like the, the local homeowners and the house, like we're somehow neighborliness has been, been lost. And so for me, like that element is like key, a key part of it. I don't know, Pat, like what you, like how do you perceive that that sort of interpersonal element connecting to the political, which is bigger, right? Well, I mean, you're describing that the conversation can't even begin until we start seeing people as people, right? And as people, we understand all populations have good and bad amongst people, right? So I think a lot of times we're stuck in a situation where we're, we're creating policy just based on the worst of us, just based on the people who are problems and are not conceivable of solutions that can work for the bigger group uh, in, in health mobility, since this is a lot of times 
a population that is stuck at the low ends of the rung and and have a hard time breaking out right so so things to enable mobility like uh, education like uh, opportunity to uh, make something of value and then having that thing of value be able to get to market right uh, things like that I think uh, give people a chance from this level to take steps of themselves and then uh, and then you know uh, begin to generate good outcomes uh, personally and then those good outcomes I think have a way of rippling out through the community so as a person running for office I feel like this is where I'm trying to intersect all three conversations the activist conversations the lived experience conversation and the policy making conversation how do we get those three pieces to uh, talk to each other and not pass each other and then how do we, from these three uh, uh, settings get decisions that can actually begin on the ground and then touch people for good I'll, I'll take it. I, I'm, I'm gonna punt it to you. So, yeah. because how do you, how do you feel like like anybody who's out here, you know how to make the distinction. You know who the true artists are. You know who the troublemakers are. You know, et cetera, et cetera. Like, how do you see your approach specifically? Like, a lot of people say like housing. We need housing, right? But if you're keeping it real, like we all know there's mental health issues. We all know there's drug issues. Yeah. How do you how do you see people making a discernment? Like Pat and I probably could by name go through folks because we're out here all the time and lots of neighbors who like to engage and you know could do the same so yeah so how do you how do you do that discernment right or incorporate that into policy yeah i mean think about like what, the way we talk about it like when we talk about like out of frustration because there's a crisis people are like well, what are we going to do about the homeless and there's like the we and have the agency to do about the homeless. And it's, so it's like, the we is the people who have the housing, and the homeless are like folks over there, and they all get kind of lumped in, of the homeless, right? And not treating this community as this like complete spectrum of human behavior, from, from you know someone who's employed and just recently lost their apartment to someone who has deep mental health and substance abuse issues, right? And so making sure we're not painting with too broad a brush, because the fact is, people's needs are on this huge spectrum, right? And we can't paint with this too brush, too broad of a brush. Uh, but then when it's also like, when we talk about agency, what we are going to do, it's as if the people who are on the streets don't have agency, you know? And so it's like, Pat was telling me like all the things he does. He like makes, sure, first of all, he's a writer, right? So he's like, he's writing for the Venice Beachhead. Or Pat will uh, make sure that he sweeps up and is clean around, uh, you know, the area where he lives. Uh, and so it's like, uh, you know, like what, there's a conversation that has to happen all right, with Pat. Pat, what do you want? And what Pat wants is obviously very different than someone else down the street uh, here. Uh, and of course, though, on a policy perspective, we need to be scaling up, right? Creating pathways off the streets because we, you know, we know, you know, approximately 80% of the people who are on the streets do want to, uh, you know, to get off the streets. Uh, obviously, mental health services, drug treatment services. Like, there's so much that we need to scale up. But there's that expression. Uh, there's nothing for us without us, right? And so this needs to be obviously involved and have take direction from the people who are actually experiencing, you know, being on the streets. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting passing around. I was, I was saying earlier, like, from my experience, you almost need to, like, I was saying we, we almost need a new word that's not homeless um, or homeless because you're automatically framing somebody by, like, from a capitalist standpoint, right? Like, I, I was a, in a studio, like, I was never called a studio person or one bedroom. You don't think of somebody and judge them that way, even though if you have more money, you can afford a two bedroom and not a one bedroom or one bedroom versus a studio, you know? And so I feel like we need to we need to call it what it is because if you think about Venice and the history of Venice, like you're not gonna stop creative people from getting off buses, right? Like you're not like I'm an artist. I came out here, I was broke. I lived at the I lived and worked at the Venice Beach Hostel. I had a movie that had premiered at Sundance like two years before, but shit is tough in the film industry, and sometimes you find yourself broke. 
I luckily have a lot of family and I think there are so many people in Venice and COVID has made this worse. I met people who like were models, personal trainers and stuff and they could live in this kind of, you know, the like couch surfing economy. They're homeless, but you can't really tell they're homeless because they don't present any of the symptoms, visible symptoms of homelessness, right? right. And I feel like that's one of the ways we have to, we have to steady, we have to steady the, the, the population to recognize that there's people falling and rising, right? And sometimes they find themselves in a place where if we were to conceive of a solution for 50,000 people, it's really for 100,000 people because there's all these people that are doing it so masterfully you don't even know they're homeless, right? And I, and I almost feel like that's kind of where the policy has to, has to see it as. We have to think of it as uh, what can we do to, uh, to make things available for all of the different types of homeless. And when I say available, I'm saying there's money being spent already. We're already uh, uh, deciding that this is something that needs resources and energy. And we're spending resources and energy on it, right? So how can we do it in a way that, that, that captures all the different people and then make the money be efficient in a way where it's not just